So welcome to everyone. Um, I'm just going to say a few words just to kick us off. This is, in spite of what it looks like, this is meant to be a very informal discussion of targeting versus but it universality. Like an interrogation with the light and shining in our eyes. <laughs> but it is really informal. We do just want people to think about the issues just because they've is they're issues that that have come up in discussion for for different groups of us. So we really want help in thinking about them. Um, so we're just raising the the pros and cons of each in order to discuss them. So I guess what we're what we're on about is we're thinking about whether we can how we can change things for children. And we've got a couple of different goals that we're thinking about. We're thinking about all children and doing something like raising the mean on, or lowering the mean on whatever it is. So is it reading, is it math, or lowering it for something like aggression? We're interested in, in how the whole population moves. We're also, I think, interested in social disadvantage because we, we really know the effects of social disadvantage on social development and cognitive development and that over time. So the issue becomes how best can we think about giving more, making it more equal for children across the society. So it's both all children and it's disadvantaged children that I think we're thinking about and that's what we'll be talking about today, okay? So let's kick off with Mikhail and then we've got an order which is really organized to the computer, the type of platform that people are on. So you're going to have to be a, little, be a little cognitively flexible in thinking about these things. But we trust you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Michal Roman. I think I know most everyone. But um, in case you're not a regular here, I do research on quality and early childhood education programs. And so the questions of whether interventions that are meant to support young children and their families should, we should, whether we should think about them um, in a universal way or in a targeted way um, has been on my mind for a while. Um, I'm afraid that I've got more questions than answers in this regard and really was thinking this is a discussion and a, a, and a starting point. Um, what I'm going to do in, in the sort of few minutes that I've been allocated is give some very crude definitions for what we mean by targeted and universal, um, discuss some of the pros and cons of the two approaches, give an example of a hybrid approach that I think is quite interesting, and then end with a few questions. Now, Jenny allocated us five minutes each, and as I was walking here, I was thinking that I don't think any academic is capable of just talking for five minutes. So, so I've extended it to seven, but I will be a little harsh. Well, we know she's tough, so I'm going to talk very, very fast. And I'm going to get my time. <laughs> um, when I think about interventions, or it's not necessarily even interventions, it's programs for young kids, I think about um, wanting to improve the lives of young children and their families. Um, and also, a, a lot of the discussion in this area has been about increasing productivity and output. And I, I turn to my colleague, Michael, because he's an economist, and he's much better at thinking about productivity and output in all sorts of ways than I am. Um, it, it does sort of, I, I do think that these questions really lend themselves or call for multidisciplinary answers. Um, and, and as I was thinking about even what, you know, what our goals are, it, it draws for thinking about things from multiple points of view. Um, more specifically, it, it means, or it sort of in, in terms of trying to think about how to operationalize that, it may mean raising performance, and that can be in a host of ways for all children, this is what Jenny was just talking about, or trying to close the gap. And that, those two goals would lead to quite different forms of intervention or programs, obviously. Um, so some of, I think some of these, the questions about universal versus targeted approaches really has to do with what we're trying to achieve. And I suspect that for different goals and for different types of programs, the findings may be quite different in terms of effectiveness. Um, so that's, you know, again, that goes back to having more questions than answers. Um, very crudely, um, targeted inter interventions or programs are ones that are provided to specific individuals based on some characteristics. Um, of that individual. Typically, we think about family income, maternal education, um, forms of disadvantage in society. Um, there's also an approach that, that uh, 
well, that, that targeting can happen both in terms of the characteristics of the person, uh, but sometimes it's done based on location. Um, so that's, that's generally referred to as place-based uh, targeting. It, typically that's driven by the proportion of people with particular characteristics in that location. And sometimes there's a hybrid of targeting particular locations and then outside of those areas targeting individuals. Um, we have that in, in Toronto in many ways where sort of uh, centers, like the municipal centers are operated that uh, offer free services in high needs um, areas. Whereas in other areas, individuals may qualify for free services that they have to go through a whole process to get. Um, universal services are provided to all individuals in a given area. Um, I've intentionally avoided the issue of whether they're free or subsidized um, because I don't know that it's central to our question today, but that's certainly a factor that varies. Um, in terms of some of the pros and cons, in general, uh, targeted interventions are lower because not everyone is receiving the, the intervention. Um, there's smaller display, displacement of private spending. This is sort of economics <laughs> talk, but basically, if you've got some parents who can afford, afford the services anyway, like preschool, for example, um, if you then make it available to everyone free of charge, you're putting onus on taxpayers as opposed to the parents who can can give the, their kids the services anyway. Um, targeted uh, services have been found to have higher per child returns, so you know, sort of do per dollar, the return is higher. Um, it, it, this issue is a is a complex one because the, you know it's a question of whether you look for absolute gains across society, where universal even for um, non targeted interventions, there are still returns, although the range of the estimates are very widely. Um, so it's a matter of whether you're looking at the return per dollar or absolute returns overall. Um, these administrative costs that are associated with determining eligibility are a lot higher, obviously, than targeted interventions, and they're non-trivial. Um, the example, I, uh, uh, one example is the city's um, subsidy for childcare process. It's very labor intensive, it has to be done regularly because uh, a related issue is that families fall in and out of eligibility, and so the monitoring is frequent. Um, and, and there's also something quite arbitrary about it, because we know that the relationship between, um, between disadvantage economically for the child and uh, outcomes is not, you know, it's sort of even middle class kids, uh, it's, li it's, well, it's not exactly linear, but um, it's not clear where the cutoff should be for making the services available. Um, so there are often cases where a child is not eligible for a program, but really it's, it's sort of arbitrary because they're right at the cutoff. Um, and so you get, you get into labor-intensive uh, needs to assess the eligibility, and then you get into these situations where, because of changes in family circumstances, kids get the in and out of services, and the continuity is, is really diminished because of changes in employment status, moves, and so on which you don't have with the universal approach. Um, and, and then there's, there's, it's clear that targeted approaches often miss a lot of the kids that, are, that the services are intended for. We know that from Head Start programs in the US. There's lots of examples of it. Um, so we have sort of pros and cons uh, on both sides. Um, there's, other, there's issues of stigma, uh, lack of enrollment because of red tape. Um, the stigma issue uh, is, I think, an interesting one. Um, and it's related to peer effects as well. So if you make, if you only target services to at-risk kids, there's some findings that um, that having kids with the, with sort of higher risk factors is is detrimental. Um, so you run into that issue as well. Um, there there really are arguments then all over the case about whether there's more political will to support universal funding uh, or less political will, where there more money is channeled towards targeted or less, meaning that the programs are better or worse, qual or worse quality. Uh, I think this is where it becomes, an, it's, it's, not, it, it's really not an empirically based argument. Um, and to some extent, I think that's okay. What I want to know is what, is, what is the evidence that we tell us, that we have tell us, and then we can make decisions about whether we want to stick to what's evidence-based or make decisions based on moral issues or political issues, other factors. Um, one example of, of an effort to sort of combine the two approaches is um, the Triple P Positive Parenting Program. I, I assume that most of you are familiar with it. 
Um, basically, it's a it's a it's received a lot of empirical attention, um, which is is nice. Often our interventions are not very well studied, um, and the goal is to support child development through parent and and family education uh, supports. What's interesting about it is that there are five levels of intervention of increasing intensity, and the the specific intervention that a, a child and his or her family gets is based on their needs. So. Um, very quickly, the, the sort of broadest level is community media or information campaigns. It's really about uh, educating parents about what works in child rearing, um, and everyone is it gets access to, in, in Triple P to that it, wh where it's been implemented. It's not implemented everywhere, of course. Um, it, you then move in increasing uh, degrees based on the child's level of uh, the difficulty, what kind of what level of behavioral problems he or she has, and the level of dysfunction that the family has, so that the most intensive services are provided when the child is experiencing a lot of difficulties and when there's some real dysfunction in the family, like um, maternal cl clinical depression or, or real family conflict. And so it, it's it's universal in that everybody's getting something, but then the level of what they get really varies based on need. Um, and in terms of efficiency, I think that's an approach that makes a lot of sense. It may not make sense in some contexts, like in, you know, how do, how do you apply that kind of approach to, to kindergarten? You know, do some get, kids get full day kindergarten? Do some get, kids get, you know, full day kindergarten plus other services depending on that need? Um, so again, I think thinking about targeted and universal may look different in different um, policy arenas, uh, thinking about different programs. Um, Overall, as I've said, I've got more questions and answer than answers, um, and and really, it's you know, what does the evidence tell us in trying to guide decision making? What other factors might override what the evidence tells us and what we decide to do? Um, and even thinking about what kinds of data, what kinds of research designs, uh, how do we study this question so that we can uh, we can make decisions in a more informed way? Um, which types of interventions, when, you know, whether universal versus targeted, some kind of hybrid. Um, these are all questions that I think we need to think about in a much more systematic way and and um, gather data to inform. And, and part of this my colleagues will address in subsequent talks. Did I keep to my seven minutes? No, you didn't, but you didn't do badly. <laughs> Thank you. That's okay, as good as it gets with Jenny. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that so far nobody's decided to do real cool PowerPoints, and um, also that I'm not as so far, it's just me. Right, so far, right? That's in the sample so far to date. The PowerPoints aren't that cool, so I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're off to a good start. Yeah, we're off to a good, good start. And I just to declare from the start, I don't feel quite as ambiguous about uh, where I come, uh, where I think the evidence comes down on this uh, on on the, this issue. And I am going to try to uh, to define what universality means because it's not universally um, what universal universality is is not universally. Uh, we don't all have the uh, same definition for it. So often it's, it's um, and we know that when we do some uh, public policy polling, we find different responses depending on what the definition is. So if you look at universality as being free, we get far more supporters for, from it as opposed to when we talk about universality being where there is, uh, where uh, affordability is not a barrier to participation. Therefore, you charge different fees depending on family's ability to pay. We get very different responses whether we say that it, you know, it's a compulsory program whether than a voluntary program, again, depending on what the program is. We also get different responses when we say, well, every, you know, the big thing about universality is everybody gets treated the, the same. But in fact, one of the principles of universality is that while you have programs that are available to everyone, that there is special outreach, special, um, special accommodations made so that everyone, in fact, does get to um, does get to uh, participate. So with those caveats, I'll go on. Uh, we tend to think of universality as something that, that is um, uh, our intervention programs and particularly of something that raises the bar for kids, right? So we, you know, we tend to think about better reading scores or higher graduation rates or whatever. But, but 
particularly for childcare, which is a program that is, you know, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, may be universally um, uh, provided or may be quite targeted. Um, nevertheless, the uh, child care is expected to produce a range of things in addition to improving those sort of academic or, um, outcomes for, for kids. And sometimes they're very child, uh, they're very child related, and sometimes they're, they relate more to the neighborhood, to the, to the family, or to, uh, to social outcomes. So, for example, um, there's a, there seems to be some uh, relationship between good child care and, uh, and good neighborhoods, between um, good child care, good uh, early childhood pr programs, and uh, social solidarity, uh, more, um, uh, you know, more exposed, you know, that seem to be good to expose kids to differences early in life, um, et cetera. Um, then we go to the evidence. This comes out of the um, out of the earlier study, and it looks at the difference in access for um, low income uh, for children from low income families. Uh, the dark uh, bar being Quebec, and the uh, light bar being on Ontario. And the difference is is that Quebec takes a more universal approach to the provision of um, early childhood than um, Ontario does. In fact, most of Ontario's uh, public funding for, uh, uh, for childcare is targeted to, uh, to disadvantaged families. And although that there is a gradient where we see that um, more, um, you know, that the uh, better resource the, the family is, the more likely it is that their child will uh, be enrolled in an early education program. Um, Low-income kids are still doing better in Quebec under universal approach than in Ontario, where we're, where we're putting almost all of our resources uh, into uh, ensuring that they get into uh, programs and yet are not doing a very, very good job. Um, we found the same, uh, 4chan uh, did another study in Quebec which found the same sort of, of, of outcomes in the research that we did around Toronto First, first Duty. What was interesting is that we found that, um, that uh, that the families that were accessing the Toronto First Duty programs were accessing them in the same percentage as what they um, as what they were in the in the community at, at large. So there's there's some pretty um, significant um, and consistent findings that uh, that in fact the universal approach does capture uh, families that are um, are most disadvantaged. That doesn't mean that you don't need special outreach. Um, and that in, and that there should be special outreach, and that really tends to make um, to make a difference as as well. Um, the other thing that we find, and again, this is looking at um, uh, information that came out of the NLS uh, NLS CY, and is again we see that gradient where uh, low income children from low income families are more likely to experience uh, vulnerabilities, but when we actually look at the numbers of children, and that's the right-hand side of the um, of the, the bars, we see that uh, when we add up children from affluent, moderate, and low-moderate families, they actually outnumber uh, the number of children with vulnerabilities as opposed to as opposed to low-income families. And again, this this particular um, chart looks at vocabulary skills, but we see the same trends whether we're looking at um, at at numeracy. Uh, uh, and social uh, social skills as, as well. Um, again, uh, we seem to see that uh, that if we're looking for advantages for disadvantaged ch children, a universal approach seems to serve them um, them a bit better. So that big big British British study that was um, the findings of, of Sylvia and all uh, a major review of George's. Um, uh, pro universal preschool programs again found those same kind of, of out outputs, and France in the 90s did a major major study of its universal um, uh, école maternelle system, and again found that there was a um, that uh, that it was uh, quite successful at narrowing the gap between disadvantaged kids and kids from uh, middle and, and affluent families. It didn't eliminate it but it did narrow the, the, the gap. And I think that this is a rather important one to look at because some of the fear is that, okay, if we give it to all kids, we'll bring up the bottom, but we'll also bring up the top. 
and we'll still just, you know, we'll just have the same gap, but we'll just move it up a bit, a bit further. And um, this study would indicate that that doesn't, um, that doesn't happen. Um, the other thing that we find on the on the other side is that targeting programs tends to bring down the um, uh, bring down outcomes for um, all kids. So that we so that uh, again, this is from the um, from the big UK longitudinal uh, study that children that were uh, from uh, you know moderate and more affluent uh, uh, families who went to um, high schools. Uh, junior high schools where there where the majority of the students were low-income and disadvantaged students in fact all of the students um, uh, performance went down and their attitudes towards schooling uh, schooling went down and their dissatisfaction with schooling went down as opposed to when the percentage was flipped um, that everybody's uh, rate uh, went, went up again um, in Looking at the OECD and the work that it did during the uh, during the, the 90s of reviewing uh, 12 of its member states uh, for sort of what was in place that tend to uh, that tend to support uh, better quality, more access, and more e equity of, of access, it was found that those countries that took a more um, a, a state approach, a more publicly managed approach, and a more universal approach were more likely to um, provide access, more, more equitable access to more children than those that took a more market or targeted um, approach. There's also some um, evidence that, uh, that a universal approach promotes quality in, in programming. And these are two studies that come from, one comes from the, uh, from the US uh, which found that when there were um, uh, that in programs that were uh, that weren't dominated by low income uh, low income kids, uh, then in fact quality was much higher than those uh, than the, in those programs than those that than those that were. Hence, you often get that uh, saying about programs for poor kids turn out to be poor uh, to be poor programs. The other thing that we found, and this was both a uh, this is a study that is. Uh, going on now in uh, in Atlantic uh, Canada and one of the things that it found is that when you deliver intervention programs to disadvantaged families from a universal platform is that families tend to be more compliant with the programs you know because it's, it's just far easier to come to the school and have the intervention programs delivered there rather than it is for them to you know take a bus to five or six different intervention programs or even if it's only one or two um, that, that there's much higher levels of compliance with the interventions that are offered uh, than there are when they are uh, when they're not delivered as part of a, of, a un, of a universal approach. Now CAP C, which is a universal program, also found that when it switched from identifying um, identifying families that should be have an intervention uh, to providing um, uh, interventions on a neighborhood, level so that families didn't have to self-identify in order to get the support that they were also much more um, successful at both reaching reaching families and the outcomes that they were um, that they were get, getting um, uh, Mikhail went through many of these uh, many of these points so I'm just going to show them to you uh, quickly and um, uh, leave it at that well done thank you okay, seven minutes ten. Really? <laughs> no, no, I'm allowing people ten. But she's telling us seven. I'm telling you seven minutes. So now I'll allow myself ten too. <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> okay. So okay. Um, so let me just say I think we're talking multiple different potential outcomes here. We're all we're talking things around cognition in children, we're talking social emotional, and I think we're also talking parenting. And what I, this is not my area of expertise, so what I've been doing is going into the literature really to look at meta-analyses, big studies that have looked across many, many studies to try and find answers about how these delivery things can operate. And, and I think 
we may have evidence for different kinds of effects according to the outcome that we're looking at. So I think the other outcome that we might be interested in is parenting, uh, which then links to child outcomes, but, but through, we're saying through parenting. Most of the interventions that we have around parenting, around this issue that I started with, around social disadvantage, and it's not just disadvantage as a function of income. I think we shouldn't be thinking that at all. It's, it's social disadvantage, which is around uh, adolescent, teen parenting, parents who are psychiatrically unwell, um, financial instabilities, adolescent parenting. All of these risks we now know cluster together. They do not come singly. Once you, once you look at all of these risks, you, very, you can get a very uh, quite a good prediction about these trajectories over the life course. So um, I guess I'm interested in something called the Matthew effect, and that is that the rich get richer. And that's been demonstrated for reading. Uh, Keith Stanovich showed the earlier you read, the better you become at it, the more you can link to different meaning systems and make progress in terms of that reading to learn and learning to read, okay? So, so in or, it, more that you can make progress on reading to learn. And also in math. So if you just look at this, this is what I'm worried about. When you look at six years old, the, the income clusters are more tightly clustered together. When you look at the kids when they're 12 years old, there's a fanning out. And that's what I'm concerned about, is that this fanning out might increase through universal programs. So the potential danger is that less disadvantaged people benefit more. Um, and, okay. But, so that's the position that I sort of start with, but then as I'm reading the literature, I'm really seeing some evidence for universality and I'm seeing some evidence for, for targeting, targeted programming. So let's just take a, uh, a regression discontinuity design. All that means is that there's an introduction of pre-K into Oklahoma. They have a cutoff around uh, the, uh, at a particular point, September 1, and you have to be a certain age. So what they do is they take the kids who have got the kindergarten because they were older versus the kid that one day older versus the kids who didn't because they were younger okay so they just then do a comparison across those two and we now know that that reduces some of the selection effect that we get when we look at when we when we look at people going into programs so the, uh, I'm going to show you some data specifically on the, this Matthew issue, Matthew effect, but the effect size is good. So you're seeing 0.79 of an effect size, which is strong. That's saying there's really a pretty powerful effect of this intervention on these children's outcome. And you're seeing similar for reading and for spelling. But this is then where I, when I'm reading it, this is what I'm kind of interested in, excited by, is that these, the gray bars will just take a letter word and, you know, then we have different ethnicities, more and less disadvantaged in the U.S., Native Americans versus whites. You are seeing better outcomes in some of the, of the disadvantaged ethnicities than you're seeing in the white kids, okay, in the, Euro, in the uh, Caucasian background children. So in this case, we're not seeing, this is it, uh, published in Developmental Psych, and we're not seeing um, a, uh, a Matthew effect there. Let's take another one. We'll move to another outcome. This is about aggression in children. Um, so these are universal programs for violence reduction, reduction and they're customized, randomized, cluster randomized control trials. So that means that they have groups, uh, that they, they, have, uh, they randomly allocate schools to interventions. So the whole school will experience the intervention. And, and what we're looking at here then is the change from uh, we're, we're looking at a, a pre and post 
um, or we're looking at a comparison across in this randomization. So some of these studies have pre and post both in an intervention group and a control group, and some of them do not. And this is a meta-analysis, so they've grouped over thousands and thousands of kids here. So there are 53 studies, and there are, there's a, something like 560 kids in each study. Uh, so they're massively large studies. And then you get, look at this, where you get, you're looking at the kids' outcomes then on reduction of aggression. That's what we're looking at. So if it's zero, there's no difference between the intervention and control group. And we are seeing big reductions across most ages, not so much in middle school, but in pre-K, in elementary, in high school. And overall, we're seeing substantial differences between your intervention schools and your control schools that have been randomly assigned. Okay, so let me just, now Katrina will, will um, I'm glad she's here, this will, this again speaks to this Matthew effect. This was a study that Katrina was involved in and it's just, it's a single study, it's not a meta-analysis, but I think it shows us something really nice here about intervention, we've got intervention and control schools, again, a, a, a cluster randomized trial. And what we're looking at here is number of maltreatment types experienced. This is one of these things that clusters, it clusters with income, teen parenting, um, uh, parental psychiatric problems. It's one of these cluster disadvantage factors. So, uh, and very harmful to kids. So of all of, this, of all of the predictors of psychiatric disorder in children, this is the highest uh, maltreatment. So what we're saying is we've got, we've got kids who have been maltreated and kids who haven't. We've got control and we've got intervention. These are the intervention schools, these are the controls. And what we're seeing is a greater effect here in the, uh, on, we're seeing a nice effect on these disadvantaged children really keeping their levels of aggression low. So I, that again is arguing against this Matthew effect. It's saying even though it's being delivered to everybody, some kids are really benefiting from it more, and those kids who are benefiting from it more are those kids with maltreatment histories. So, so that's a nice finding, I think, of, of Katrina and her colleagues in child abuse and neglect recently. Just a, a meta-analysis then on parenting. Um, improvements, uh, so improvements in parental functioning improves uh, improves chances for children. We know that. We have lots of studies showing us that. This is a meta-analysis from, uh, from the Dutch group um, show, based on 56 intervention studies, seven, over 7,000 families. Um, this shows a relatively small effect, but what I want to talk to you about is the, is the issue of the Matthew effect. And that is that we are seeing stronger effects of these parenting programs in this meta-analysis in the middle SES range than we're seeing in the low SES range. So if you're giving everybody, if you're giving everybody the same, then the people who are benefiting from that more are the middle SES family. So this is a Matthew effect. This is the richer getting richer. Those people who are not disadvantaged are going out there and getting those parenting programs and my God, those kids are doing well and, and the parents are doing well and that is less of an effect that we're seeing on the, on the uh, uh, low SES. Okay, so it's a, this, is, this is just, you know, some thoughts that I'm wondering about then. So universal works for some outcomes but not others. Are we seeing good effects when we're looking at school-related things for children in both cognition and things like aggression? Um, is this universal a way to handle contagion effects? 
what we're seeing, what we now know in some in in research, is the higher proportion that you have of children in a classroom with a problem, the more problem that is for other kids who don't have that problem. So there is a contagion effect that we are we are now documenting on things like poor language, aggression in children. And so is it that these universal programs really operate best on these outcomes where you do get contagion effects and less well uh, in parenting programs? And that's me. So I think we're over to you, Michael. And we're switching now, right? Or was it or Erica? We're going to do Erica first. OK. Hi. Um, so um, I come with a very sort of um, different perspective. It's, it's a mixed perspective in some respects. Um, I grew up in Canada. I lived here for uh, 15 years and then moved to the States and lived there for 15 years. So what you'll, what you'll get here is um, a Canadian perspective in one, on one hand, but certainly given um, uh, my experiences, sort of what that looks like or, or what, what um, my impression is given where I sit, who I am, what my background is, and, and the context in which I live and work, which is in the, in the States. So I work for a foundation um, in, in Chicago, and uh, it's the McCormick Foundation, and we have typically, what we have over the past 15 years, made heavy investments in early education. Um, I would say close to $90 million. We, we give annually about $6 million to early ed policy. Um, actually, it's early ed policy, practice, and research. Those are our, our funding areas. Um, so we... So we've been in the field a while, and we have worked very hard to help develop a comprehensive system in Illinois. And so what I'm going to talk to um, you about today is really looking at the, these two concepts, universal versus targeted, and um, giving you sort of an overview of, and then you, most of you know about the research already, that what research that takes place in the States with respect to targeted, the preference for targeted um, interventions. <clears throat> but then look at nationally what that means and then um, shift to what that looks like in my context in Illinois and how that plays itself out for families and children. So three main arguments in the states that we know um, for targeted programs have been, because, have been because they're more cost efficient and they cost the public less. Another is that they are believed to be higher quality because they're focused in their delivery. And the other is that um, there's been historical preferences for targeted programs. Um, so, yeah, again, you know, it's this, it's this feeling that America comes from a perspective where rather there is a real, there is a real um, fear that if we give everybody the same, those children, those families without, that have been historically um, part of communities that have been um, discriminated against, will not get what they are due. And so there's this constant legacy and, um, and fear that we have to equalize the playing field. And in order to do that, we need to be able to support those families that have been without for, uh, for an extended period of time. So the current um, landscape in, in the States um, has been to, well, what I should say prior to this is that over the past 10 years or so, we've had an increased um, interest in, in um, supporting universal programs, universal preschool programs. And when I mean universal preschool programs, again, various definitions, but for, but for the most part what I mean is that all three and four year olds would have access to early childhood services. And then um, because we don't have um, a parental leave policy, maternity leave policy, that's equitable, some would argue, then of course zero to three really becomes a significant part of what we mean in terms of um, 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 an entire comprehensive system. So currently we have, we have, because there's also an interest in the states with regard to increasing school readiness, increasing global competitiveness, um, there's been a great interest in, in investing more in, um, in early ed programs, so you're seeing more of that. However, 
over the past few years, we have seen some significant, obviously the economic um, downturn has had some significant um, impacts on state budgets. And so what you see here is um, a, lot of the, a lot of the negative outcomes that have come as a result. So what you have is 60 million um, nationwide um, funding has decreased that much. And 30 million decreased, obviously, over 2000, 2009, 2010, so since the, um, the, the, the economic collapse. 127 million in federal funds from ARA have been invested, but they haven't been replaced because states just simply don't have the funding. And, um, and these, this data actually is from NEAR, so, so that's um, easily accessible. It's a 2011 um, report card on the states. Um, so 26, so when NEAR did this study of, um, of all of the states looking at the investments, only 26 out of 39 states um, were able to sort of maintain, maintain funding per, per child. 11 increased while um, eight, com, 8 sort of um, decreased their, their, um, their spending. So again, what you see happening here is states are broke, to put it bluntly. And so those states who have spent years, such as my state, who spent years investing heavily in early ed, um, because the states have, have had such economic challenges, we're seeing a lot of those states really sort of decrease in their, um, in, in, in their funding investments. But, um, but are trying and working hard to find alternate ways of supporting and bolstering their investments. Hence the need for private funding such as our organization and others. So some of the recent trends as I mentioned that, we have, that we've been seeing is school readiness. The school readiness debate is, is a big issue. Um, again, politicians want, um, uh, politicians and, and the business community quite frankly are really looking for increased access. Um, there's, a, there's a heavy, uh, there is a heavy weight to sort of push down on, um, push down into, into, um, into the early years, more sort of school readiness types of components, making sure that, you know, we have children that are going to um, compete globally and assessments and accountability and, and standardized tests. So we have a real pushing down effect into the early, into the early years as a means, as a strategy for um, getting population, getting population, the general population to do well. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, state budget shortfalls have really, in, um, have really compromised quality and um, has really compromised quality as, uh, for the most part. And so what you really have is, is um, people just, there is actually this debate between, and I'll talk about this later, this debate bec between access and quality. What people are now, what people are now um, um, having um, a lot of discussion around is about whether or not we increase the slots, we increase access, or do we have to do that in, in, in the face of losing quality? And because, again, the state budget shortfalls are so dire, there, um, this debate that we thought we had solved years ago has been unsolved and it keeps reoccurring, or it has recently reoccurred. So in the state of Illinois, we have two main programs. We have Preschool for All, and we also have the Child Care Assistance Program. And the Preschool for All was designed um, back in 98 to support, it was a universal program, a universal platform with the idea that all three and four year olds would have access to, to um, preschool programs with a set aside for zero to three. 11% of the budget would be used for zero to three services. What has happened? is that over the years, um, there's been um, a decline, obviously, as I've mentioned, in funding. And we have not been able to, to we have not been able to fully fund the, the program as it was originally intended. And even, even though it was universal in, in spirit, the idea was that the at-risk population would be serviced first. And so what we've done since 98, we've only been able to support those children or those families that have been at risk, and even then, not fully. So, uh, as you can see, we've got um, numbers. We've, let's see, we've got, again, you can see just a, a, a percentage of those children are actually being able to, uh, are actually accessing, even though we see, we're seeing growth here, 
in reality, and as the years go on, we're really, we're really seeing that we have um, growth is declining, access is declining, in part, as, I, as you will see later, because parents are not able to access um, programs. There just simply aren't enough slots available. So when you, again, when you look across Illinois as a state, this particular um, chart gives you a good sense of how many children are actually being served. So low-income children are actually being served. So really, under the age of one, only 40% of the children are actually receiving services. 39 between one and two years old. Um, they're close to 40% of children from three to five. And so the total number when you look at across the pro, across um, children being served in the state, only 40%. That means 60% of the children in the state are not having access. And so where are those children, those poor children? So in spirit, the idea of a targeted um, approach is a good one in the sense that the research does show that these children and families do benefit. But the reality is, is that with with the lack of funding, the lack of investment, or the, and the increasing um, budget shortfalls, we are, we're going to end up seeing over the next few years, fewer children, even fewer children being served, fewer slots being available. And so this chart sort of reflects in Illinois the types of programs that we have. So we have a state-funded preschool program, early Head Start and Head Start, um, program service and funded by IDA, which is our um, Disabilities Act. So these are all sort of state and, and federal funding streams that come into the state and then are distributed just to focus on, that focus on um, targeted, targeted communities and focuses on children that um, are in uh, great need. So what you have here is, once again, the numbers just don't quite add up. We still are seeing a, a, a small percentage of children overall receiving the kinds of um, services that, that um, we would hope would benefit them. Let's see, did I go? Let's see. No. Okay. So this. Um, so what this so what this particular chart, chart chart shows is that over the course of five years, the level of um, participation of children in these various programs. Now some has actually stayed fairly constant. Illinois has worked really hard. Um, our advocacy communities worked very hard to maintain maintain funding levels in spite of the budget shortfalls. And that is unique in the sense that we've always had a very strong advocacy community, but it's been challenging. We've had a lot of state leadership changes. We've had a new, um, a new mayor um, and a new administration at the city level and the, um, and the state level. So what this has required is a lot of re-educating of state legislators um, to help them understand the need for, um, for increased investment. So, but as a result of um, the advocacy the advocacy and the persistence of our advocacy community, we've been able to somewhat maintain, but not without um, tremendous, uh, tremendous hard fought uh, wars. Um, hard won, I should say. So, the long and the short of of what we're seeing in the in the state is that targeted programs certainly do benefit children um, of low in, in low-income communities and high-poverty communities. We see the gains. We see, um, well, we see the gains in, in, in early ed programs. What we don't see is a part of the inequities is that a lot of our children in these high-need communities have to go to neighborhood programs, neighborhood schools. And because, we, because our tax funding base is, um, is primarily property taxes. You've got the communities that have, the communities do not have the tax base to sustain quality neighborhood schools. So you've got quality programs, a few quality programs serving a, a, a small population of children, going into school neighborhood schools that aren't that aren't doing well. 
And so even though in some cases there isn't as much, you have the cognitive, um, the social emotional gains remain consistent, but the cognitive gains do end up slipping over time, particularly if those envi that environment stays the way, um, stays the way that it is, if the community stays the way that it is. So we've talked a lot about early education being um, the research shows that early education is effective or one of the most effective factors that can help bring children out of poverty. What we're seeing, however, is that though it is, there are all these other mitigating factors that take place in a community that if those are not controlled for, they can, they can, they can, affect, they can and will affect children as they sort of move throughout, the, um, through, move throughout their, their, um, their education and, 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 and professional life. Um, so I guess in s some of the challenges that we see going ahead, um, we anticipate that there will be fewer fund, there'll be less money available to fund these programs. There'll be expansion, expansion will be difficult. We have um, increased, po our demographics in our state are changing significantly. We have um, one, in e one in five children are from Latin American descent. And so with an increasing, increasing population of folks coming in from all over South, all over South America, <coughs> Central America, and not having the provisions and the resources to support them within the state, we're seeing a lot of um, inequities. So for instance, we have, we have expanded services. There are slots available, but the slots are in, the slots and spaces are in communities that are, that are not needed. And so it's a catch-22. You've got these slots in these communities. You've got this growing demographic where the, where the resources are not available. And then you've got this, so you've got a mismatch between this, where the spots are and where, what the community needs are. So there has to be some work, reworking around that. And then if these programs don't have their spots filled, and they are filling them, but they're filling them with middle-class children, if they don't have these spots filled, then they're going to lose their funding. And if they lose their funding, then it becomes sort of going back to ground zero to re to, to re educate public um, policy, um, policy legislators, state legislators, and others to justify the need for continuing investment in early ed. So um, I think where we come where, where we where we where we come down on this is that at least in Illinois, a universal platform is ideal. Um, a universal platform with at-risk, um, very clear at-risk components that will help to support those families that are in most need, um, but we're challenged economically as a result. Thank you. You want to yeah. So uh, Michael Baker is last, and then we will uh, discuss. Okay. Um, so what I want to talk about is um, sort of the process of constructing an evidence base when launching a universal um, program. Um, and, and what I'm going to talk about is based on a paper that I wrote last year, basically on, on this topic. And there, there are three points that I'm going to make that um, are sort of gone on at length from the paper. The first is that relative to the evidence that we have about targeted programs, uh, evidence about the impact of universal programs is relatively scarce, and it doesn't tend to give the sort of unambiguous guidance to us that the evidence for targeted programs do. Now, I should be upfront about my biases of sort of reviewing this literature. Uh, I'm an economist. Maybe that's enough said for a lot of you. Um, that's not a bias. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I do tend to emphasize in the report um, evidence that's, I mean, ideally based on experiments, but since there's not a lot of experimental evidence on universal programs, um, at least based on what are called natural experiments, playing off policy changes or perhaps regression discontinuity, sort of program parameter uh, oddities, rather than the observational literature. There is a lot of observational evidence, but that's not why that emphasized here. So what I survey are sort of three general areas of universal, and I guess when I, when I use universal, and I also mean sort of large in scale, okay? So I'm really looking at large scale interventions. I look at maternity leave programs, I look at childcare provision, 
and I look at preschool. Okay, and I'll just show you because of the time, um, sort of a survey of some of the um, evaluations of large scale childcare programs from around the world. Um, so as you see, there's a number of studies of the Canadian one, and that's studies of Quebec. Um, there's a study of um, the program in Denmark, and then a couple of studies um, of programs in Norway. Um, and in terms of sort of what sort of guidance do we get from that, as you can see down the findings, you have a variety. It really, if, if you came into this with a particular point of view, you could find the study that um, supported that. Uh, on one hand, uh, the Canadian studies offer evidence of some negative effects at the mean, though this recent study by Kotlinberg and Lair um, sort of gives some context for that. They confirm adding additional data. There is a negative effect in the mean. This is looking at behavioral outcomes, but there is a positive effect at lower income levels. You have the evidence from Denmark that is offering a conclusion. This is a little later at time, seven years, the children are no effect for preschool, but a negative effect of family daycare for low income males. And then in Norway, um, there's sort of two studies. Um, one finds a positive effect, though in this case, they're working off a discontinuity in the subsidy um, um, schedule. So essentially comparing ch children that are sort of on either side. So some children receive a lot of subsidy, other ones don't. And in that case, they're not getting a big change in the use of care. So this is really isn't a care effect, it's more an income effect. Families who get a larger subsidy have more income, and this seems to be what's probably driving that result. And then this other study um, that's looking more generally at a child care program, and here they do find a positive effect, um, but it is for low income children, and actually the effect they find for high income children is negative. So in that sense, the program is equalizing, right? It's bringing the lower end up and the, the upper end down. Um, the surveys of evidence in maternity leave programs and universal preschool programs present similar issues. You, you find a mix of results, okay, measured at different periods of time. And, and really in any of these areas, okay, there's always the question of fade out, okay, that while we might find an impact or an effect immediately after the child is treated by the program, two or three late years later, the effect may have disappeared. So the second point I want to, I want to make is as an alternative, often backgrounders or evidence collections for, for universal programs draw on the evidence for targeted programs, okay? Perhaps because they do show, as been pointed out, some extraordinary benefits and perhaps because there just isn't a lot of direct valuation of universal programs. And I want to sort of suggest that this may not be a great idea for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that the populations of targeted programs can sometimes bear little resemblance to the populations treated by universal programs. And to sort of, as an example of that point, I'll, um, I want to put up some data for a very well-known targeted program that turns up in almost any backgrounder for a children's program. People always draw on the results of the Perry Preschool Program. Why? Because in some sense, the effects are so extraordinary, right? This program appears to have had an extraordinary impact on these well, the treated part of these 123 African-American children who were facing quite sort of desperate um, circumstances. But this isn't the graph you usually see. The graph you usually see is a comparison of the treated group to the control group. So what's interesting is how much things change. This is just the outcomes for the control group through their lives, okay? And what it shows you is children who really face some quite desperate outcomes, right? These children have now been followed up to age 40, okay? And I think the point, two points come of this is one is they're very different than the children who would be typically treated by a universal program. And it's at least possible that they face certain challenges that would be different than the delays we document in more advantaged children, I'll call. And that these sorts of delays may respond differently to treatment than the, the, the delays or the challenges faced by more affluent people. So one is, is trying to project off this into a universal program, we're talking two very different populations. The other is, is typically we're talking very different treatments, okay? 
that many of these targeted programs were relatively well funded. Okay, so here are data on, again, two very um, prominent ones, ones that are regularly cited, and two things that are easily to quantify are the expenditures per child and the sort of caregiver staff, uh, the child teacher, child caregiver ratios. So in the Perry Preschool project, the expenditure is almost $18,000 per student. And these, besides having an array of services being offered, including meetings with parents, the children were in classrooms where there were four teachers for every 20 to 25 students. S similar, though not quite as rich, sort of statistics come out of the ABC Darien project. If instead we sort of survey some examples of universal programs in Canada, what we see is typically they're funded at lower levels per student and the ratios at which children interact with their teachers or their caregivers are different, okay? So again, as a basis for projecting what would happen in a universal program, we're talking different treatment populations and we're talking different treatments. Okay. The third point I want to make is about evidence that, in a sense, children being at risk is not a characteristic exclusively of low-income families, okay? And while that is, as we've seen earlier, and I'll present some other evidence, that certainly seems to be the case, we know very little about, or I'd say relatively little, about the trajectories or the consequences of being identified at risk when you're a young child, when you're more advantaged, okay? So what I did um, here is what I've done is taken some data from the NLSCY, and at this point I'm looking at children in the first waves of the data, okay? And I'm looking at what I call their cognitive score. I've also done this for behavioral scores and at age zero to five. So this is a combination of the motor social development score and the PPVT score in that survey, okay? And what I've done is on an, a single age basis divided the children into quintiles, okay? And then I'm gonna make a comparison of children whose families are in the lowest quintile of S social economic status to children whose families are in the highest quintile of socioeconomic status. So the clear bars, if you want, are the distribution of the poorest children and the solid bars are the distribution of the children from the richest families. While it's certainly true, a higher proportion of children from the poorest families are in the lowest quintile of cognitive performance, it's also true that a non-trivial proportion of children from the high and richest families are in that quintile. There's a slight socioeconomic gradient here, okay, but it doesn't sort of overwhelm you. This is the point that's been made numerous times in support of universal delivery, that being at risk is not exclusive providence of poor kids, right? So this is made by, for example, McCain and Mustard's work. It's also made by the graph by Doug Wilms that's so often cited, okay? What I next ask is, okay, this is what it looks at when you're zero to five, what happens over the next 10 years? So what I'm gonna ask is, if you were in the lowest, sorry, if you were in the lowest cognitive quintile when you were at zero to five, where are you when you're 11 to 13? And now I'm measuring your cognitive outcomes by math scores that are available. So I'm following you in the NLCY. This is what that looks like. So the clear bars are for our children from the lowest, the poorest families, the solid bars are from children from the richest families, and the hatch bars are sort of average means. So take, for example, that tall clear bar on the left-hand side. What that's telling you is if a child was in the bottom quintile of the cognitive distribution when they were zero to five, and they were also from the bottom quintile of family SES, there's almost a 45% chance that they were still in the bottom quintile when they were 11 to 13. In contrast, if you were in the bottom quintile of cognitive outcomes at zero to five, but you were from the richest family, there's less than a 
probability you were still in the bottom quintile when you were 11 to 13. In general, what this graph tells you is there's a much higher probability of persisting at low levels, okay, if you come from a poor family. Families, the, the children from the richest families have, for a variety of reasons, probably including remedial action taken by their parents, a much higher probability of moving up the cognitive distribution. This is what it looks like more generally. So what I'm here is graphing is the probability of persisting in the lowest quintile of the cognitive distribution by your quintile of family income. So the first bar is the bar for the children, the poorest children. The next bar is for the second quintile, third quintile, fourth quintile, fifth quintile. As you can see, there is quite a dramatic socioeconomic gradient. Okay. Finally, how about if things go well at zero to five? How about if you were in the top quintile of cognitive achievement when you were age zero to five? Where were you when you are now 11 to 13? Well, if you come from the poorest families, there's a very high probability you've slipped back down to the bottom quintile of cognitive, achieve cognitive achievement. However, if you come from the richest families, there's a quite high probability that you've persisted there. Okay, so there seems to be a socioeconomic characteristic to how initial evaluations, if you want, of, of the challenges children face, what the consequences those, of those are later on in life. So in summary, I, I sort of make three points and then sort of one point for moving forward. Existing evidence on the impact of universally early childhood education programs does not provide the clear guidance, at least my reading of it, that evidence for targeted programs do. The evidence from targeted programs may not provide a great basis to project the impacts of universal programs. They serve different children with different programs. Third, the consequences of being at risk at young ages may vary significantly by socioeconomic status. So finally, sort of the way, I, at least one of the things I think it's important to do as we build an evidence base for universal programs is we have to recognize the fact that the majority of children in universal programs are more advantaged, okay? And while this isn't a way of obviously rallying dollars from donors who want to change the world, we need to know more about advantaged children, okay? What are the delays that they face? What are the consequences of the delays they face? And what are the responses of those delays to the sorts of treatments that we offer through programs? Thank you. Okay, we're all we're all set. That's all you're going to hear from us. But we want to we stay right there because we want to talk and hear your thoughts about about this issue. And I just one Jan, um, I just want could you say one word about your universal? I just I think that's important. One word. Good. <laughs> Two sentences. Very good. No variance. Okay, so I'm doing um, a research project on the um, implementation and uh, of the full-day kindergarten program in Ontario, and I'm comparing it to a match control sites and other sites that have integrated early childhood services, but they're not the full-day kindergarten. And uh, the initial analysis of year one has shown significant benefits for the children in the full-day program. Vocabulary, early reading, um, even drawing, um, all kinds of benefits. But I'm collecting the year two data right now, and I think that will tell a better story, because then we will have some sort of trajectory to look at. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so yeah, Katrina. I have a leftover question for, sorry, is it Doug? Michael. Michael, sorry, Michael. Um, this is, it's not directly um, what you presented, but it's been a question that's been bugging me. I was at a presentation um, here not too long ago where the argument was that for maternity leave, um, that the programs essentially paid for themselves as a result of the dollars that came back into the tax system as a result of women working. So that the dollars spent on any kind of support for um, uh, early childhood care actually come back uh, immediately, into, in fact, in, over into the system because uh, of the taxes that people are giving. Can, can you speak to that at all? 
Uh, not very much, no. I mean, my valuations have primarily, the work I've done in this area primarily focused on child outcomes, and that's okay. been my main. We did do some, in, in our, a study I participated in on Quebec uh, program, um, we did sort of make a back of the envelope calculation of that, and our estimate was it did not fully fund the program, but there was some payback from it. But I am I'm, and not in any way up to speed on that literature because it hasn't been the focus in the work I've done. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Karen's got some. Um, just a, <clears throat> that I think probably what you're thinking about is Pierre Fortin's and et, et al's uh, work that they that they did, and they found that because of low cost childcare in in Quebec about 70,000 more mothers were working who otherwise would not have been working without, without low-cost uh, childcare, and that the taxes that they paid combined with the services that they did not draw on any longer because they're no longer eligible for them covered the entire cost of the, of the program. And I think why it's, it, they found greater results than you did, Michael, is because just it, there's more coverage now than there was when you did the, did the study. Carl, yeah. Well, I'm really grateful for this. Uh, Shout! I'm grateful for <laughs> these presentations. Thank you so much. Um, I've been thinking about these things for, for many years, and to hear them actually expressed by others is uh, really very exciting. I guess, uh, I mean, it seemed to me there was a little bit of a nature versus nurture tone to what we're thinking about, and that it seems to me we have to have an array of targeted and universal programs, and so one can't be better than the other. And the ecologies of these things are very poorly understood. So I just want to make a comment, but I think I have real difficulties when I, I listen to uh, or I read meta-analyses, and I, you know, I, I'm always fascinated by Michael's presentations, thank you, but thinking at the economic level, I sometimes think that realities have been glossed over. So just to take one example, I think a number of years ago I wrote a sentence about that meta-analysis of parenting programs to increase the home uh, scores. And I wrote a sentence that said something like, but the rich get richer, even though we see some effects of these programs. So it's exactly your point. So I really resonate with that. But when I think about, you know, why is it that uh, economists like Duncan and many other people conclude, well, we don't do a very good job on supporting parenting, or those programs rarely work as we want them to. I think that uh, one point, for example, that I wondered about in that meta review was, are the parents who are less well off actually sticking with the program? And does the program really meet their needs? Because after all, the home is sort of what do we have in the middle class home, and are you doing that? And if you're not middle class, you know, you're not doing it right. I mean, who knows what the dynamics are, but one question is, do the parents actually go through the whole program if they're not middle class? You know, what's the dose or the participation levels? Because that's often a problem with parenting programs, uh, particularly for groups who aren't middle class. So what is it about those failures of parenting programs before we say, oh, you know, universal doesn't work, or this parenting program doesn't work, without knowing more about the ecologies of these things and simply sticking with the big collections of numbers. I think those big collections get us thinking. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's Sorry great. Sorry to go on. No, no, that's great. Can I, can I respond to that first? I, I think that's a great point, and I think we... What we know from all the intervention literature is the hardest people to access are the people who are most disadvantaged, right? I think you're absolutely right. They're not sticking to the program because it doesn't have the same meaning for them. It hasn't been constructed, you know, from their ecology in some way. So I think that's a, that's a very, uh, I, you know, I think it's a very good point. Um, yeah, so, so I'd, I'd agree with that, but I'd also really, you know, just taking up 
what Michael's saying, just in the natural, when we're just looking at these things naturally, and when all, we look at all those trajectory studies where we get fannings out as a function of SES, those worry me, right? They really worry me. Yeah, Sue. I was quite intrigued by actually the title of this, Targeted Versus Universal. I think we spent a lot of time arguing that there's a place for both mm. in, in a community um, because both achieve, each achieves something different. Um, so I was actually really interested in your looking at, at, at Triple P, the, where they're using a blended model. And this is playing out in a huge way right now in the province. Um, as the province makes a decision to end the universal component of the HBHC program mm. um, and shift its resources because we don't have enough to uh, from universal to targeted um, and you know while I can't fault them on a choice to beef up the targeted piece we feel that the, 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 the pro that both the targeted is going to suffer too from a, a, a lack of the universal programming so I, I, I guess I'm just calling on a little bit more research and a little bit more evidence that helps su support the case for the I evidence agree. of both and the importance of both to achieve a, a good outcomes. Population level? Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you completely. I think, I think a hybrid is what we need to be thinking about, both economically, um, you know, also ev in evidential terms. Uh, yeah. I think yes, but probably the question that, that really needs to be answered is that, is it more effective to deliver targeted programs within a universal exactly. system mm -hmm. as opposed to target, standalone targeted pro programs? And that's the ultimate question. Yeah, and I think that that is really the, you know, that's the question, maybe that's our next one yeah. as, as, we look, as we look at that. Yeah. Yes, and that, that's really what the, what the triple P does, right? So it's a population based, but then you get your levels of care on the basis of your levels of need. That's what healthcare does. It's what, it's what healthcare, healthcare does. education exactly. does. It's like exactly know, what libraries do. You, yeah. you know, it's mm -hmm. yeah. So now you wanted, and then Alistair. So I have a question for Michael actually. I thought it was interesting that you put up that chart, um, you know, outlining the effects of uh, studies in Canada and then comparing those with studies in Norway and other settings. So I wanted to hear your impressions. I haven't read your paper yet, but I will. <laughs> um, but I want to hear your impressions on to what extent do you think that those differences in effects have to do with the nature of the population? So for example, Canada is a very multi-ethnic, heterogeneous population. So when we're talking about advantage or disadvantage or marginalization, there's many different levels at which you can be marginalized, not just socioeconomic disadvantage, but also, you know, other sorts of uh, factors like, you know, immigration status or refugee status and other things. So I just wanted to hear your perspective on um, whether or not you have a sense of whether the population mattered or might have had an impact on the nature of the effects that you saw. Because the Norway examples, if I remember correctly, were those that did show, a, or were more likely to show a positive effect. And the Canadian examples were the ones that were more mixed and perhaps more negative based on your analysis. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, <coughs> for your speculation. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, um, I certainly agree that um, every study has characteristics that are probably crucial to the interpretation, population being one of them. Um, but for example, um, take the example of a maternity leave program. Um, we tend to group together programs that change care at different stages of a child's life and basically move around the point where the mother or the father returns to work, right? So some will say, well, this, is, this program showed positive effects, but essentially what it did was increase care to four to six months, so the uh, parent went back to school, I mean, back to work at six months, versus a program that maybe changed a European setting from one year to two years and so delayed that. And we don't know whether um, care at those different points of time have different effects or leaving um, the, the parent-child separation has different effects at those different points in time. So certainly it's possible that um, populations, I mean, in the Canadian evidence, we're looking at Quebec as the primary treatment population. So um, it's not quite, uh, Toronto in your head, it, it, it's a, you know, a different part of Canada that has, a, has its own um, particular mix. Um, 
But it's also true that the Norwegian studies are older studies in the sense that they're retrospective on policy changes when Norwegian society was probably relatively homogeneous. And so perhaps a better point of comparison for those are the, the, the evidence from some place like Denmark. But, I mean, these are things that we gather over time. So I just recently read a, a study in Norway that targeted districts of Oslo with very high proportions of immigrant families in an attempt to um, essentially provide um, preschool to them to promote language facilities. And so these things, we gather this evidence by time. I, I don't have any direct evidence that, you know, I can say, well, yes, because we know that, you know, the difference between these two populations is such and such. Mm -hmm. But it certainly seems plausible. Mm -hmm. Alistair. Uh, it's very very interested in, in the, uh, the notion of a, a hybrid uh, program. And I think uh, Eric you provided the example in, in Chicago where you're really doing the very, very best you can uh, in the face of a diminishing uh, economy and, and lower funding for uh, early years education. I guess thinking uh, about Canada in the future, while we've rolled out early years, uh, only some of the provisions of, of the Pascal recommendations have been implemented. And those affecting, for example, Aboriginal education don't seem to be uh, going anywhere. And um, uh, I, I read with interest an article in the Times recently about um, uh, in Brazil they have provided universal access to the arts through a 1.5% payroll tax. Now I don't think for a minute that in the States that would fly. <laughs> I'm sure it would sink Obama's ship very quickly. Uh, and I don't think that in Canada uh, there's any chance of universal access to the arts uh, through a payroll tax. But there may be, uh, for Canadians, uh, interest in, in uh, some kind of uh, tax for um, uh, universal access to early years education. What, what do panel members think about that? In other words, who's going to pay for it? <laughs> um, again, if we go back to the, the Quebec research, I mean, there, there, tends, there, you know, there tends to be this, this trend that if you make, um, if you combine education and care, which is what Pascal was trying to do, you not only get the benefits for the child, you, you allow mothers to enter the, work, the workforce. And in particular, you allow low-income mothers where um, without, low in, without um, affordable child care, there's no way that they can, that they can enter. So you get the, you know, the double be benefit of the taxes that they pay, the fact that they're being lifted out of poverty, therefore they're not drawing down on social programs um, as, um, as, a, as extensively. I think that there is that there is an appetite. We just saw the poll that came out of the you know that was in the papers this this week about that there is an appetite amongst Canadians to see slight you know increases in their taxes you know sort of across the ideological spectrum if it means if it means more equity. Um, there seems to be some agree you know there seems to be some agreement at least amongst um, uh, elites uh, that. Early, the interventions in early childhood are great, are great e equalizers. And I think that that holds true, and this is, I, uh, I think both Michael and I were showing this from a different, uh, from different perspectives, uh, that even if you're looking at kids under five or looking at kids once they're entering into, um, uh, entering into high school, is yes, your likelihood of being vulnerable is greater if you're, if you're from a low SES. But if you add up all those kids who aren't from the lowest SES, they still outnumber in terms of number um, those kids that are from, from the, lowest, um, the, the lowest SES. So if we want to see population changes, if we want to make, really make those population to, um, to changes in terms of sort of the things that interest policymakers like higher productivity and you know, greater high school graduation rates and, you know, well, you know, and then also interest business, you need to make those population changes not just enough to raise up your, um, it's not just a, it's extremely important to raise up your uh, kids from your lowest SES, but there is, there are challenges across the, 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 the spectrum that families, you know, regardless of where they, um, are, where, where they land, just simply because raising kids is really hard, right? And nobody does it alone, or nobody, you know, traditionally has done it alone. So last word to Erica and Mikhail. I, I have a question, you know, or we had universal junior and senior kindergarten before, um, right, it, at part day. We decided, I don't know who, what the we is, but 
to go to full day, um, if we took the notion of having a sort of a hybrid approach, it, w it might have looked very different. Keep it at half day for everyone, you know, flag the kids who are at risk, and, and maybe, you know, we take Michael's kind of data and combine the risk as in their performance with some kind of family risk and give those kids only the additional services. Mm -hmm. the, it all comes, it, it, to me, in a perfect world, everybody would have universal everything, but we have limited resources. How do we use them strategically? I see the literature as, you know, we have a lot of observational studies in my area, uh, looking at quality of programs in particular. It's often the case that there's the feeling that because there are a lot of studies on, on a particular topic, even if they're bad studies, which most of them are, including my own, because they're observational, right? So somehow you know, the bias is, well, there are a lot of studies that, that show X, but they all suffer from the same methodological limitation. Um, so we don't really know about a lot of these, these issues, and we have limited resources. Um, so how do we move forward? And I don't, you know, I guess my inclination and the, and the feeling in the room is that maybe this kind of hybrid way is, is a good way to proceed. That's not what we've chosen to do, you know, not at least in terms of how we're spending the bulk of the dollars. It's not that there aren't, there isn't targeting in the school system because kids are flagged for special education and so on, so some more targeting of supports. But we could have done that in, in a much um, bigger way and used our dollars differently. I don't have the answer whether that would have been better, but I'd sure like to know, given the stakes. And going back to Jenny's repeated comment of it, really, is it's worrisome to, to look at this divergence. Uh, I feel very uncomfortable about the talk of sort of doing anything to those lucky kids who are, you know, at the top. Like, I don't think that's the way to reduce the gap. Um, but I, I think we, we really need some more information as we, did, as we make these decisions. Erica has the last word. Go for it. <laughs> um, you know, I've talked a lot today about the, um, the limited resources that the United States has. But the reality is, is that we are one of the highest spenders of, um, or investors in education internationally, coming out with the, the least amount of outcomes. So the, money, the, so the money's there. The money has always been there. It's just, it's been, in, in many of my colleagues would argue, it's just been unaccounted for. And so, contrary to what most people might believe, a lot of Americans, I think from the outside looking in, a lot of people feel that Americans don't want to be taxed. And to a degree, there is a, you know, there is a, a group of people out there that certainly believe that. But I think um, there is a growing number of, of um, the pop segment of the population that wouldn't mind being taxed, wouldn't mind being taxed if they knew that there was that their dollars were being invested in a way that was going to equalize the playing field, and that it would lift it would lift everyone up as opposed to just just a few. In fact, there was a, a, a document that was circulated um, some time ago that really made a strong case against such programs as Race to the Top and Early Learning Challenge Fund because of the, the philosophy of the sort of winners versus losers. And, and what they called for was to um, look at the amount of the billions and billions of dollars that are currently being invested in the system and to rethink and become more creative about how those, how those investments are made. And so um, it, my feeling, my personal feeling, my professional feeling is that the money is in the system. What we, have, what we have failed to do at this point is have the political will, um, or we've, we fail to, um, we have fa fail to encourage those who are decision makers to really think about, to have the courage to make the kinds of decisions that they need to make and to hold people accountable so that we can actually um, even out and make things more equitable for everybody. So, Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.